it's time for us to begin our evening worship. Glad that everyone that can be here this evening, especially if you're visiting with us. We will have a couple of few announcements before we begin. The open song this, this evening will be 475. 475. Brian English, uh, we want to keep Brian English in our prayers. He's the husband of Annette Perry's granddaughter. Uh, he had surgery two weeks ago and he's uh, struggling with blood clots in his arm. So let's remember Brian English. Also, Tim and Francis King, they were here this morning. It's really good to see them as well, along with the Burnett as well this, this, this morning. Uh, Tim has continued to have treatment for uh, his cancer. Uh, so let's continue to remember Tim as well. Wanda Thompson is, is, is having surgery in the near future. Uh, no exact date on that time frame, but let's pray for her surgery and her recovery when she does have that. Uh, this morning we announced that uh, Loretta Wallace's granddaughter uh, was, was in the hospital at the ICU, having issues with blood. I talked to her mother this morning, and they say that she's doing better. They seem like they have the blood, uh, the bleeding under control, and uh, her daughter is doing, Latasha uh, Wallace is doing better, so let's continue. Pray for her continuous improvement. Just a reminder, there are some items in the downstairs that are in the kitchen area on two tables that uh, need to be uh, disposed of. So if you have some items uh, that you may have left uh, on one of the last uh, events or something, please check that out and remove those items before they be uh, tossed out. Uh, this coming up week, remember being to remember standing in the gap, uh, formerly men's fellowship will be Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Uh, if you're able to attend, please bring drinks uh, and desserts with you as well. Ladies' Day class will resume uh, also on Tuesday at the 10 a.m. on February 15th, so ladies, remember that. Uh, new Movers Baskets distribution will be uh, Saturday, February the 19th at 10 a.m. Uh, we'll be meeting downstairs, so if you're able to, to attend and help with that uh, New Movers Baskets, please uh, be there at 10 a.m. Also, there will be a Ladies Day on March 19th at 9 a.m. Uh, the guest speaker will be Emily uh, Hatfield from Henderson, Tennessee. Uh, if you would like to uh, help with the Ladies Day, please sign up. Uh, there's a sign up in the foyer if uh, any ladies would like to assist with that event. Also, just remember tonight after service, uh, Car Care Group 2, uh, leaders of Allen Bates and Jim Green uh, will have that in B1 this, this evening. Okay? But before we begin, let's begin with a word of prayer. Oh Lord our God, we are eternally grateful, Father. We are eternally blessed, Father, that you are our Savior, Father, and Father, you are worthy to be praised, Father. Father, we thank you so much for your beloved Son, Father, and all that he has done, all that he has did, Father, and continue to do, Father, through his, his blood that he shed upon Cabbage Cross, Father. Father, we thank you for his love that he would Submit himself to this, the rigors of this life, Father, that he would. Let us set this life as a man, Father, who struggled with the, the temptations and things that we had as well, Father, but yet still, Father, he had no sin. Father, his intoning blood that he shed upon Cabbage Cross, Father, have given us the opportunity, Father, if we are obedient to your word, that we have that opportunity, Father, to have eternal life and be heirs with you, Father. We're so thankful for that, Father. Father, we thank you for this church family, Father, that what it means to each and every one of us, Father, here in this, this city, Father, that we have a church family that we can lean on, Father, that we can come to for support and guidance when we go through tough times, Father. We thank you for each and every one, Father. We can, Father, pray that you continue to bless this congregation here at Sidewell, Father, not only this congregation, Father, but your congregation throughout the world, Father. May it continue to be the light and the best speaking of hope, Father, for all that want to know you, Father. Father, we pray for those who have fallen into sickness, Father. We pray that you, if you would, Father, look to each and every one of their needs, Father, what they stand in need of. We pray, Father, that the things that they may go through, the surgeries they may go through, Father, the rehabs that they go through, that you will see to their needs and improve their health, Father. It would be your will, Father. Father, there are many who have fallen into spiritual sickness, Father. We pray that if it's your will, Father, that you give them uh, clarity that they have fallen short of your will, Father that it may be something that we may do, say, Father, that would encourage them, Father, to build them up, Father, to want to return back to you, Father. Father, continue to play for this country and the things that it's going through, Father. Father, it's the greatest country in the world, Father, that you can be in, Father. 
But Father, we all have flaws in this country as well, and we pray, Father, that we will continue to be the people that you want us to be, Father, that we we'll continue to lift you up whenever we can, Father. Father, we pray for our ministers here at Sidewell, for Gary and Derek and Logan, Father, and Ed, Father. The work that they do, Father, we pray that you continue to bless each and every one of them, Father, and their families. As they labor here at this congregation, Father, we pray that we will give them all the support, support and Father, that they need. Father, we pray that they will continue to have that zeal and boldness, continue to speak your word and speak it according to your holy word, Father. Father, be with us through the entirety of this service, Father. Forgive us when we fall short of your will. Let's return and repent of those things. It's your name we do humbly pray. Amen.
Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we are indeed thankful, Father, for this beautiful day that you have provided for us, for the opportunity that we have to come to this place and worship you, the true and living God. Father, we are so thankful for all the many blessings of this life and so many other, Father, we cannot even number them. We're thankful for all those spiritual blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. And especially, Father, we're thankful for his word, for your word. Father, we know that it guides us in our ways. We pray, Father, that you will help us to use it, help us to stay on that narrow path. Father, we are so thankful for this church <clears throat> that you provide for us here this place. We're so thankful, Father, for each and every member. We pray, Father, for our leadership, for our elders. We pray, Father, that you will continue to give them understanding and wisdom as they guide this flock. We pray, Father, that you'll be with our deacons and the works that they are under. Uh, they are doing and father we pray that each of those works will be successful father we are so blessed here with four good ministers and we're so thankful father for that we pray father that you'll be with all of our ministers and their families as they labor here amongst us father tonight we'd ask that you be with gary and help him and father as he breaks the bread of life to us help him to have remembrance of the things that he has studied and father help us to take this lesson and open it up in our hearts and help us to use it for thy glory Father, we are always mindful, Father, of those who are number who are sick and those who are undergoing treatments and those who have lost loved ones. And Father, you know their needs. And we pray, Father, that you'll help us to reach out to them and help them any way that we can. And Father, we pray that you will lay your healing hand upon those who are sick, if it be thy will. And you would give strength and courage to those who are bereaved. Father, we, we are so thankful, Father, for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We we pray, Father, that we will be the light that he would have us to be in this, in this world, individually, Father, and also collectively. We pray, Father, that we'll work together here at this place to seek and save the lost. Father, we love you. We thank you for all that you do for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're on 163. 163. There's within my heart a
Good evening. Good to see everyone this evening. This morning we began to look at the concept uh, of the conditional nature of the promises of God. If you want to describe it a different way, you could talk about God's covenants, because that's really what we're talking about. God's promises are incorporated into the various covenants that he made with certain people. And these covenants always, for the most part, included both promises and conditions. God would issue a promise, but he would place it on a conditional basis. And so we began this morning by looking about at God's promise to Adam. And in that promise, really, Adam had the opportunity, the door was open to eternal life. That is, as long as he met the condition. He could not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When Adam and Eve violated that exact condition, then guess what? They were cast out of the Garden of Eden. We next look at God's promise to Noah. God's promise to Noah was that he would preserve Noah and his family and all the various animals that came to him. They would be safe, even though God was bringing a flood of waters on the face of the earth. Again, that promise was conditional. It was conditioned on Noah doing what God told him to do. You've got to build an ark. You've got to build it the way I say to build it. And so it had three stories, for example. It was made of gopher wood, which we don't know what that is, but he did. It was pitched within and without with pitch. That's the way it was. And Moses observes, Noah did everything as God commanded him, and thus, guess what? God saved him. He kept him alive. So there was a case where God's promise was brought to fruition, and it was a rich fruition in the case of of Noah. We went from there and looked at God's promise to Abraham. It was a promise that he would have his name be made great, that he would have nations come out of him. It was a further a promise that he would receive a land and that ultimately all nations of the earth would be blessed through him. We'll end up talking in the last point this evening somewhat about how all nations are going to be blessed through uh, Abraham. But even that promise to Abraham was conditional. He had to leave his father's house. He had to go away from a permanent dwelling place, and he had to go to a place that God would show him. He didn't even know where that would be. But Abraham went, trusted in God, and because of that, because of his trust, it was accounted to him for righteousness. You want to check that out? Look at Romans chapter 4, which has a rather extensive discussion of that righteousness of that man, Abraham. Then we moved on this morning and observed the, God's renewal of the covenant with Abraham. In reality, we could have talked about that the remainder of the day, not just for the morning. We could have kept right on going. Because that promise was renewed with Abraham. It was renewed again with Abraham after he was willing to sacrifice his only son. It was renewed with Isaac. It was renewed with Jacob. And in a sense of the word, you could say it was renewed with the children of Israel. That over and over again, that promise moved its way down the line. But that promise, too, was conditional. It was conditioned upon Abraham. Every male descendant of Abraham being circumcised. Of course, Abraham was circumcised, and he had his sons circumcised, and those that worked within his household were circumcised to fulfill that covenant that God had issued. We came to realize that that was a foreshadowing of what would go on for us, that we too, in order to be a part of the new covenant have to be circumcised, not with the circumcision of the flesh, but instead through baptism, having 
the fleshly sins be circumcised off of us so that we might receive forgiveness. Tonight, we're going to look at three other promises of God. Obviously, there are many more that we could look at, but these, we hope, will illustrate the preeminent point that all of us need to understand. There is no more practical lesson that we could talk about today than this lesson, spiritually speaking. If we do not come to rely upon the promises of God, if we do not remember always that they're conditioned upon whatever it is that God says they are, obedience in general, then we will fail to enjoy the promised land. By the way, on our Wednesday night class, probably in about uh, three Wednesday nights, we're going to come to Hebrews chapter 4. And when we do, we're going to learn that those people did not receive the promise. Why not? Because they failed to obey God. Because of that, they could not enter into the land of promised rest. And what a tremendous failure that was. Our promised land of rest is heaven. I don't want to fail to enter in. I don't believe any of you want to fail to enter in. And so that is the great lesson that we're trying to learn from looking at the conditional nature of the promises of God. Next, tonight, let's look at God's promise to protect Israel. In Leviticus chapter 26, beginning at verse 4, here is what we find Moses reporting that God said. Then I will give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last till the time of vintage, and the vintage shall last till the time of sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none will make you afraid. I'll rid the land of evil beasts, and the sword will not go through your land. You will chase your enemies, and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you. That's a pretty remarkable promise, don't you think? In fact, there are multiple examples and points that are made within that. But ultimately, what we see there is God's promise to protect them. He's going to keep them safe in every sense of the word. They're going to have plenty to eat. They're also going to be safe. They're going to be secure. They're going to live in peace. But even that promise is conditional. Back up now and look at verse 3 of Leviticus chapter 26. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them. Notice that. If you do, then what am I going to do? I'm going to give you all the things we read about just a few moments ago. Just in case they missed it, go down to verse 14 and notice that God effectively repeats it, unfortunately, on what I might call the dark side of this thing. Listen to what he says. But if you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgments, so that you do not perform all my commandments, but break my covenant, I also will do this to you. I'll even appoint terror over you, wasting disease and fever, which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. You shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you, and you shall be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when no one pursues. You see, that's the flip side, can't you? You see what happens when you do not keep the commandments of God. If you're one of the children of Israel, that is the promise, and those are the conditions. Let's see how that played out. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 7. As we turn to Joshua chapter 7, we're going to see what happens. Now, you remember very well that the children of Israel crossed over the Jordan River 
They crossed over on dry land, even though the Jordan was at flood stage when they made their journey across. But God said he'd protect them, and he did. He delivered them safely. The walls of Jericho fell down, just like God promised. And the city was theirs. Probably the strongest city in all of Canaan in that era was located right there. But they defeated it because God was protecting them. However, there was a problem. Look at Joshua chapter 7, particularly verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things so that the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now remember, this promise to protect them was conditioned on what? Oh, keep my commandments. Isn't that right? It's exactly what it was. What was God's commandment in reference to Jericho? It was that Jericho was dedicated. It was dedicated to him. Everything in it that normally would be taken as bounty or as the spoils of war was to be given either to God or to be destroyed, one or the other. That was the command. Achan did not listen to the command. He did not follow it. And because he did not follow it, notice that effectively all the people of, of Israel were counted as being in violation of the will of God. Go on down in the same chapter, verses 4 and 5, and see what happened. So about 3,000 men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. Now, think about this a minute. After they conquered Jericho, Joshua sent spies to, to spy out Ai, and they came back basically and said, Ai is a little bitty place. Don't waste the time of the whole army. Let the army rest. Just send 3,000 men. They can take it. It's easy. Well, no, it's not easy. Because there was sin in the camp, God did not stand on their side. He did not protect them. And they fled from the presence of the small forces of that little town called Ai. And so in the very next verse, we find the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Sherebim and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Now, Joshua thinks somehow or another God has violated his commitment to them. And you see him, he tears his clothes and he basically is saying, why, Lord? Why? And he's down on the ground, you know, wailing about this thing. But the response comes back from God himself. Notice verses 11 and 12. Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it under their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore, unless you destroy the accursed thing from among you. Did God keep his promise? You see, the answer to that question is yes. It's not the answer we would want to hear, I don't suppose. If we'd have been the children of Israel, we'd want to say, well, I'm going, I'm going to deliver you anyway, despite what you did. But no, God's promises are always conditional. And we see the impact, the effect of those conditions as we look at this. Look at Judges chapter 7. In the book of Judges, chapter 7, we come to a, a different time in the history of Israel. Now, this time, in particular, involves the, uh, the Midianites. And a, an army has come along of Midianites, an army of over 100,000 men. 
God calls to a fellow by the name of Gideon in chapter 6. And Gideon's role, according to God, is going to be to lead the children of Israel in battle against the forces of Midian. God's going to give them into his hand. Now, you may recall that 32,000 men came prepared to fight. And God's response to that was to say, no, that's too many. Send everybody that's afraid home. Now, do you wonder if these numbers would be the same if we're talking about us today? I, I've often wondered that. 32,000 men came to fight when he said, all you that are afraid go home, 22,000 went home. We're left with about one-third, 10,000 men. Now they're outnumbered uh, approximately 11 to 1. 110,000 roughly against the 10,000 of Judah. And what is God's response to that? Listen to verse 7. Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who have laughed, I'll save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. Ten thousand's too many. It's too many. How did God separate between them? He said, take them down to the water and have them get a drink. Two ways to approach getting a drink out of a stream of water. One is to flop down on your belly and just lean over and, and get you a drink out of the water. The other is to kneel with sword in hand and pick up some water and keep your eyes to the alert. How many men of the 10,000 kept their eyes alert? 300. All of a sudden, the odds have changed dramatically. From 10,000 against 110,000, roughly, we now have 300 against 110,000, but God says, I will deliver by the 300. And you know what's going on here. God makes it plain. His purpose is to demonstrate to Israel that they are not saving by their own hand, that it takes Almighty God to fight for them. And you remember what happened. Probably every child in the audience tonight could tell the story. How the Gideon divided his 300 into three separate companies, a hundred in each company, that they carried with them a pitcher and, and a torch, and, the, and as well they carried trumpets. And when, uh, when they went to the, their positions, they waited for Gideon's signal, and they smashed those pitchers, and they held up those torches, and they shouted, the sword of the Lord! And of Gideon, and then a remarkable thing happens. The men of Israel initially don't even draw a sword. The Midianites instead, in fear, begin to attack one another. Oh yes, Gideon's forces pursue in order to kill those that are remaining, but God obvious, obviously has delivered a great, great victory to the children of Israel. The 300 did it because God was with them. And so we have a promise, a promise to Israel to protect them that comes from God. That promise was conditional. When they didn't meet the condition, they lost the protection, as in the case of Achan and the battle at Ai. When they kept the conditions, even when they were faced with a massive army, the Midianites, they won the victory because God kept his promise to them. The second promise we want to look at tonight is really very closely akin to the first, and that is God's promise to give Israel the land. If you would, look with me to Numbers chapter 33. In Numbers chapter 33, we find the story of what happened and what commitment God made to the children of Israel at that particular time. Numbers chapter 33, begin at verse 50. We're almost all the way down to the end. Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan, 
across from Jericho, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you've crossed the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you should drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, destroy all their engraved stones, destroy all their molded images, and abolish all their high places. You shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell in it, for I have given you the land to possess. I'm not sure that we can really appreciate what that meant and how powerful a commitment that that was on the part of God. The armies that were in that area were among the most fearsome armies in the world at the time. The Philistines were awesome warriors, for example. Many, many great warriors were there in that particular land, and yet God says, I'll drive them out. I'll drive them before. I'm going to give you the land just like I promised a long time ago. Look at Joshua chapter 21. In Joshua chapter 21, we see an, an interesting statement that is made by Joshua or in the writing that he does. Verse 43, So the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give their fathers, and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. The Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. Now you know what? If you've read your Bible like I think you have, you're thinking... Huh? What do you mean they got all the land? Really? Did they get all the land just like God said that they would? Well, they did if you remember the condition. Because there was a condition that was involved. Look at Joshua 23, verses 12 and 13. We're now in the closing great speeches that Joshua made to the children of Israel. And in one of those speeches, in Joshua 23, verses 12 and 13, he says, Or else, if indeed you do go back and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go into them, and they to you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you and scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. It's conditional, wasn't it? What's the condition? You've got to drive them out. God's going to give you everything he promised you if you drive them out. That's the condition. Did they meet that condition? That becomes the critical question, don't you think? Did they meet the condition? Because if they did not meet the condition, then guess what? Then God has no obligation to follow through. Go to the book of Judges, Judges chapter 1. As we look at Judges chapter 1, particularly we want to look at what is written there in verse 21. This is just one example of many. I just zeroed in on one that was a relatively easy to understand short verse. But the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem. So the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. You know what? If you read the rest of the chapter, you're going to see that over and over again. One tribe after another did not drive out everybody. Oh, they drove some out. Well, at least in some cases they did. Dan had fits doing anything with theirs. But they didn't drive all of them out. And so you can truthfully say God gave them everything he promised them. You can have all the land where you drive the people out. That's basically what God is saying. Then turn over to to the second chapter of the book of Judges, 
and read a little bit further what it says about them. Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Watch that. I will not break my covenant with you. Are they going to break it with him? That's the big question. Now listen. You shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land. You shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their God shall be a snare to you. You know why that town's named, or that area is named Bochim? In Hebrew, it means weeping. When they heard what God said, they started to cry. Here we had it. The promise of the greatest land on the face of the earth could have been ours. The mighty God, the almighty God, the only true God, was going to stand on our side and nobody could have defeated us. We could have taken it all. But we chose not to listen. And because they chose not to listen, the land promise was fulfilled within limits. The limits of their own obedience. Now with all of that as a background, I want us at last to look at God's new covenant with all people. And I hesitated for a while to actually say all, but you know, the point is, it's available to all. It's a covenant that anyone can enjoy. God did not limit it to certain families, as in the case of Abraham's family, for example, or the family of Isaac, or the family of Jacob. He didn't limit it to that group. Instead, God opened this particular covenant to any and all who would listen to what he had to say. Who tells about that covenant? Turn to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31. And in in the book of Jeremiah, we will see God talking through the prophet and telling about this covenant. Verse 31 of Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now stop just a minute. Israel and Judah were no longer together. When Jeremiah wrote this by the inspiration of God, they were totally severed. In fact, Israel's already been defeated. The Assyrians have already taken them off into captivity. But here he is making a great promise. I'm going to make a new covenant. And what does he say? With all you Jews, every one of you, is going to have access to this covenant. It's not just the Jews either. It's going to be all people. So go ahead. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day, that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the hand of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. Wow. That's a covenant. That is the best covenant ever, ever offered to any group of people. And God is offering it effectively to everyone. In fact, if you think about the Apostle Peter, he gets to preach the first sermon recorded to the Jewish nation. In Acts chapter 2, he tells them how they can receive the benefits of this covenant. Remember, their sins I'll remember no more. How, Peter? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, 
and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter also gets to be the first one to deliver a sermon to the Gentiles. And that's found in, Gen in Acts chapter 10. And there he is before the household of Cornelius, and he says, what? About verse 34, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that feareth him as worketh righteousness is accepted with him. <clears throat> is this covenant for everybody? Oh, I don't think there's any doubt about it. Peter knew it was. Now he understood it. But observe that it is a covenant dedicated with blood. Look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 18. And there it is that it says, Therefore not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. I don't know if we understand or appreciate how critical blood is when we talk about a covenant of God. This morning, I, I was uh, sitting back and I started inwardly to smile when Chris Carr did the Lord's Supper. Because before we partook of the Lord's Supper, do you remember what we read? We read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Did you notice that that mentions covenant? Oh yeah, it very clearly mentions covenant covenant. And it ought to, because when Jesus actually instituted, and that's what Paul is relating there, the institution of the Lord's Supper, when he instituted it, Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, he said, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Could I give you a little sidelight there? That's the identical construction to Acts 2.38. You and I have religious friends who say that Jesus, that, that folks are baptized because they're already saved. The word for means because, they say. Well, that's interesting. Because that means Jesus died and shed his blood because sins were already forgiven. I don't buy it. And the reason I don't buy it is because he begged his father if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Very clearly, it was not possible. This covenant had to be dedicated with blood. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, the writer goes on to say, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. This covenant is going to be, was, dedicated with blood blood, but observe it's conditional. Does that surprise you? Can you find a covenant between God and man where it is not conditional? I think over and over again you're going to discover, as I have, that it is always conditional when God makes a covenant with man. And so what are the conditions? You've got to reach the blood. That's where remission is. We've already seen that. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Where did he leave his blood? In his death, John 19, 31 to 35. How do we get to that blood? This morning we saw one passage that talks about it. That's Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through, well, we went through 13. You can go to 14 if you like. It, it will tell you that you are, you reach bab the death of Christ in baptism. Similarly, in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, he says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with Christ by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead to the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. How do you reach the blood? In baptism. Peter affirms the same point. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, when he says, and by the way, he starts off with Noah. God saved Noah by water. Well, he did, didn't he? He floated the boat by water. That's exactly how he did it. Everybody else died by the same water. And you know what? Water is the demarcation line today. Everybody that goes through the water of baptism will find salvation. That's the condition. 
Everybody that refuses to go through the water will not find salvation because that's the condition. And so having talked about Noah, then he goes on to say the like figure whereunto even baptism would also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. By the way, not really well translated when you say the answer. It really is the appeal for. In baptism, I plead with God to make my conscience clean. Not on the basis of what I did, but instead on the basis of the resurrection. You can't have a resurrection without a death and a burial. And so we've got the gospel there, the death, the burial, the resurrection. When I am baptized, I'm begging God to cleanse my conscience on the basis of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And what's in that death? The blood. The condition of the covenant is right there. And so we've learned God's consistent. He always has been. He made a promise to Adam that he could have lived eternally in the Garden of Eden, but he violated the condition. He lost the opportunity. He made a promise to Noah that he could survive the flood if he built the ark, and he did what he was asked to do, and he survived. He made a promise to Abraham, if you leave here, I'm going to make a great man out of you and a great man, man out of your people, and I'm going to bless the whole world through you and your descendants. And you know what? Abraham did it. And God kept his word. He made him great. And we today are blessed because of a descendant of Abraham, Jesus Christ. He made a renewal of that promise, causing them to be circumcised in order to live under that covenant. We too, to live under the modern, the new covenant, have to be circumcised. We have to have the, the sins of the flesh cut away in the waters of baptism. We saw God's promise to protect Israel. It was conditional. When they lived up to the condition, God protected them, even against a massive army, way bigger than what they had, even initially, to fight against them. But he also caused them to lose when they failed to meet the conditions. And thus they met, they, a huge army, were defeated at, in the presence of Ai, a little bitty town. God promised to give them the land, but that too was condition. You got to drive them out. They didn't do that in every case. And because of that, the people lived among the people, and it caused them nothing but grief throughout their existence until they finally were taken to Babylonian captivity. And finally, God's made a new covenant. It makes it available for all people everywhere. It's available for you, for me, today. It's available through Jesus Christ and His blood. If you wish to be set free, He's offered it. Why not come while we sing?
Uh, just a reminder that uh, Car Care Group 2 will meet uh, the following services uh, this, afternoon, this afternoon as well. Um, Brian's Children Homes have an auction, just a reminder of that. It's uh, Saturday, April the 30th. Uh, if you have any items that you would like to donate or to give it for, for that event, uh, please contact with, uh, a William Case or Ron Clemens and they can assist with that as well. So let's just continue to remember the ones that, are, that stand in need of prayer over the course of the week as we go to our Father in prayer and just remember those who are lost loved ones as well. If you would please, let's stand for them. Dismiss them. Our closing song will be in our folders tonight at B29. If you are unable to partake of the Lord's Supper, it is prepared for you at B2. You can exit and go there at this time. It is down the hall to my right. Don't forget, uh, this coming Saturday, we're going to be going out at 10 a.m. to distribute uh, new movers baskets. This is a really exciting thing to do. If you've never taken part, uh, please come and be a part of this. Uh, we will, pro it'll probably only take about about an hour, hour and a half tops. It won't take too terribly long to, and we have about 20 or so we need to deliver. And so we can really use your help. Uh, it's always good to have, you know, group, groups of you know, like three or four or something like that to go together. And so we really could use your help on Saturday at 10 a.m. to hand out those baskets. B29. I will call upon the Lord. together and worship you and Lord I thank you for the the lesson that Gary's brought us today and that that we can take that to heart and understand the covenant that we have with God and and continue to teach others of that covenant so that that we can take as many as we can with us to heaven with you one day Lord please be with everyone who's sick and and stuck at home and and watching online wishing they could be here with us to to gather together Lord please be with them and and help them to get over their Ill, Ill, any illnesses and, and anything that they may be struggling with. Lord, please keep us safe and bring us back to the next point in time. Christ's name, amen. <laughs>